All right, hello and welcome back to Data Science CastNet. In this video, I thought I would do an informal sort of notebook walkthrough or run through for the first unit of the Hugging Face Diffusion Models course. So this course, we've just finished the third unit, um, the last one for the year. So we have unit one, an introduction to diffusion models, unit two on fine tuning and guidance, and then unit three on stable diffusion. Um, and so I'll do a video for each of these, hopefully, if the electricity holds. Um, yeah, so today we're going to look at Unit 1, an introduction to diffusion models. And what I'm going to do is just walk through the material um, at a fairly leisurely pace as we go through the notebooks, try and add in some extra code, play around with some of the things shown. And at any point, feel free to pause, check out the material, come ask questions in the Discord or reach out to me and then pick the video up again after that. Um, okay, so before you do this, if you want to sign up for the course, then you'll get notified if there's new units coming out and things like that. Check out the Discord, which is probably the best place for asking questions. Um, but assuming you've done all that prerequisites, um, what we're going to do is run very quickly through the sort of introductory material here, and then we'll spend the majority of this video in the code. Um, okay, so <laughs> just to give the context, you've probably seen lots of images generated by artificial intelligence on the internet recently. And the core technology behind a lot of these image generators is something called diffusion models. And so that's the point of today. Let's get acquainted with this idea. What is a diffusion model? How do they work? Um, and the core idea here is that diffusion models generate images, not just in one step, but over this kind of iterative ref refinement process. So we're going to start from some random noise and we're going to gradually denoise this, hence denoising diffusion models. We're going to denoise this iteratively improve it until it looks like a real image right and so this iterative nature is really key and that's what we'll see in the code today um, and so our kind of training process for this model that can iteratively denoise is to start with an existing image and to add some noise to corrupt it somehow and to try and learn to undo that and we can corrupt it different amounts and learn to undo for those different noise levels um, and so what we're going to do, and this is the kind of core loop that you want to try and keep in your head as we then go look at the code, we're going to load in some images, we're going to add different amounts of noise, and then we're going to have the model try and like undo that corruption, how to fix that, denoise that uh, noisy input. Um, so we're going to feed those noisy versions into the model, we'll look at its outputs, compare that to the noise or compare that to the like original image, and then we'll use that to update the model so that hopefully it does a better job next time. And we repeat this training over and over and over. Um, and then once we've got that model trained, we can then start from random noise and say, hey, model, fix this. And then <laughs> use that to like remove a bit of the noise, or it's all noise, but to try and improve on that noisy starting point. And then improve, 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 improve. Repeat this again and again. And hopefully this kind of iteratively denoises into something that looks to the model like a denoised image, like a, a sort of real um, image. So <laughs> we'll see that in action. Hopefully it'll make more sense as we look at the code. Um, but in the meantime, yeah, feel free to open in your platform of choice the Introduction to Diffusers Notebook and Diffusion Models from Scratch. And I think what we'll do is we'll start with Introduction to Diffusers. So these two notebooks are two different takes on the same thing. It's like, what is a diffusion model? How do they work? In Introduction to Diffusers, we are going to look at the Diffusers library, which has been built for working with these kinds of things. So this will be showing us the kinds of abstractions and code that we'll be working with going forward as we play with existing models. In the Diffusion Models from Scratch notebook, we're going to be um, doing everything ourselves. It's going to be a very hacky kind of like bottom up, build it everything from scratch, um, little demo. And I think those two will complement each other nicely. So let's start here and just make sure that you're running on a GPU if you don't wait too long. Um, and let's get going. OK, so we're going to install some um, requirements and then on your Hugging Face page, if you don't have a Hugging Face account, you might need one. Um, this is if you're going to be saving models to the hub, downloading models from the hub that require permissions. You can go and copy your access token um, and then paste that in there when we do this um, Hugging Face notebook login. Um, and this is just going to authenticate you so that you can save your models to the Hugging Face hub. Nice and convenient. And Hugging Face is the Hugging Face Diffusers is the library we're going to be using for this whole course. This is the Hugging Face Diffusion model course. Um, and so it's good to get familiar with all of their tools. Okay, so we've logged in. Uh, we also need a large file storage, git lfs, for uploading large files to the hub, and that's going to be our trained model weights are going to be bigger than the sort of default minimum size. So very, very quick and easy to set up. You just run those cells, paste in your token. Um, and then we can import a few things and just define some convenience functions for 
visualizing images. So nothing too much to worry about there. Don't stress too much about the exact details. We're just getting everything set up and we're specifying what device we're using. Okay, so that's us ready to start. Now, the first section in this notebook is uh, looking at Dream Booth. This is kind of a preview for Unit 3, which at this stage, Unit 3 is out. So I'm not even gonna spend too much time on this, but this is kind of a, where are we going? And so you can load this pipeline using this Diffuser's Stable Diffusion Pipeline. And you can load a custom model that's been trained to generate Mr. Potato Head really well. And then you can generate Mr. Potato Head. Um, really, really cool. Uh, but we're not going to spend the time downloading the model and running it. You can if you'd like. Um, that's also something that we'll see in the Stable Diffusion unit, how to load Stable Diffusion pipelines, generate images, and also how to train your own versions. So we'll get to that later. For now, we want to focus on what is Diffusers? How do we use it to make Diffusion models? And so the core API of this library is kind of three main components, three main abstractions. We have pipelines, right? Like this magical Stable Diffusion pipeline above, very easy to load, it kind of wraps everything you need, and then you can just say pipe and then pass in whatever arguments you have and it's gonna generate some outputs. So these pipelines are like pre-made things to rapidly like use existing models. And inside that pipeline, there are models, right? And in the case of diffusion, the most common architecture that we're using to do this actual denoising, like make this prediction for how to fix this corrupted image, that's gonna be something called a unit. And so then there's code it defines that unit model, and that's going to be one of the models in the diffusers library. Uh, and then finally, there's these schedulers, which we'll talk about. Um, and the idea of the scheduler is to handle like, how do we do that adding noise, removing noise? What does that process look like? So let's start with pipelines and let's load a simpler pipeline. And this is the one we're going to be training in this example notebook today. So it's going to take a little while to download. You can see I've passed this here. This is just on the Hugging Face Hub. If we were to go to Hugging Face Hub, um, let's go here. Hugginface.co slash John Whitaker slash DDPM butterflies 32 pixels. You'll see I haven't even put a model card, but these are the files that it's downloading, specifically this PyTorch model.bin. And that's got the weights of all my um, every all the layers in the unit, everything that we need to recreate this model. Um, so it's downloaded that and it's now sampling. I'm gonna create eight images. It's gonna do a thousand steps. So it's taking a little while, even though it's a fairly small model. We'll improve on that in the next unit. Um, but yeah, this is going to download this model, sample from it, and this is the perfect use case for pipelines, right? You don't need to do any hacking around. You don't have to write much code at all. You simply load the pipeline and then call the pipeline uh, with some optional arguments, and it's going, going to go and generate those images. Okay, so that's not as impressive as Mr. Potato Head for some people. I think it's pretty cool. Um, and the thing is, we're going to train this model from scratch in this notebook. Um, okay, so how do we actually train that? How do we how do we do that? Besides just using this pre-existing pipeline, all well and good, how do we train our own? Um, so remember, the algorithm for training a diffusion model from the introduction was load in some images, uh, add noise in different amounts, feed the noisy versions through the model, look at its predictions, update the model so that it makes better predictions next time. Right, so we need some good images to start with, and we're going to load some butterfly pictures. I'm just gonna set that up, grab a batch of images, um, and we're gonna be resizing these nice and small. I'm upscaling them to 64 by 64 here so that we can see them better, but the training size is gonna be 32 by 32, right? So that's why these little images that we generated here are nice and small. Um, we're just gonna keep things small and simple to try and reduce the computational requirements. But if you'd like, there is also an official training example that trains at a higher resolution. It just takes longer. Um, okay, so that should be done. Yep, we've loaded our data, right? So this is our like noise, uh, our sort of clean data, excuse me. And you can see it's not perfect. These are um, automatically cropped and background removed from some museum co collection. Um, and we just used an off the shelf model to do the background removal, so it's not perfect. Um, okay, so we have our images. Step one, add noise to those images. And that is where the scheduler component comes in. So remember I said there's pipelines, there's models and there's schedulers within diffusers. Um, so from diffusers, we can import DDPM scheduler. Now, denoising diffusion probabilistic models. Uh, diffusion models have been around since probably about 2015, but they only really took off in 2020, I think, with this paper, um, because this was the first one that got them, got them working really well. Um, and they introduced this idea, uh, you know, just some of the, the maths and things of like how exactly we create these models, sample, etc., the unit architecture. Um, and they were able to produce some really... Uh, amazing and beautiful looking images at the time, state of the art, um, since being improved. 
Uh, so this is not necessarily like the perfect way to do it. There's been better approaches since, but it is a nice baseline. And since all of the other approaches kind of build on this original DDPM foundation, that's a nice place to start. So we're going to set up a DDPM scheduler and we're going to tell it the number of training time steps that we'll use is a thousand. Now you get some models that have a continuous noise amount, like you could just have any amount of noise between zero and one, say. Um, but from the DDPM paper and a number of others, they use this idea of time steps because the original formulation was that we'd add noise n times, right? We, n could be 800 times. Um, now we're going to do that all in one step, but still this idea of like fixed time steps persists. Um, so again, sometimes a little bit confusing the terminology, but we're going to dig through it. And that's the point of this notebook is to kind of like run through these things, explore them, double check that we, we understand what's going on. Okay, so there's some scary maths. We have a corruption process that adds a small amount of noise for every time step t. So given the previous version of x, we can add a little bit more noise to it to get xt. And this is the equation. Ah, scary, what do all these symbols mean? So we're saying the function that goes to the next time step, x of t, given the previous one, x of t minus 1, and this is adding noise. Um, we are going to sample from this distribution, this normal distribution, that's what this n is, with a mean of xt, uh, no, sorry, um, a mean of square root of 1 minus beta times the current one. So we want to get the new one. Uh, the current one, we want to get the slightly more noisy one. So we're going to scale the current one slightly, and we, that's going to be the mean of our distribution. And then we're going to have some variance, some amount of noise. And that's where this beta t comes in. And this i here is just the identity function. So this is a very complicated way of writing it if you don't speak maths. We'll see that in code it's not actually too bad. Um, but the idea here is that given some slightly noisy version of x, we're going to scale it a bit and add some noise. And that's going to give us our new slightly more noisy version of x. And if we want to jump straight from x0, i.e. straight from our clean image, to a noisy image at some time, uh, we can do that by repeatedly applying this, or we can reformulate it to jump all the way to xt from x0 with this new scaling factor for each of these mean standard deviation, where alpha bar is the cumulative product from i up to whatever t we're doing of alpha, which is in turn 1 minus beta. So it's just rearranging these equations and giving us a formula for the noisy version at any time step given the original x, which is the clean version. Okay, and so we can plot these amounts, and we can see that our square root of alpha prod, um, which is this one here, is um, going to be how much of the original x is in the image. And so you can see at time step zero, it's all just the clean image. There's no noise added. Um, and then as we go over time, that is going to decrease down until by the end, the uh, square root of alpha product or uh, alpha bar, this is going to be zero um, because we've just been increasing, uh, we've had this beta schedule that, that gives us that kind of profile. Um, and at the end, it's just going to be all this square root of one minus alpha prod. This is going to be the noise, right? And um, I think the, this is a typo here. Oh, no, right. The square root versus no square root is just a standard deviation versus variance. The variance is the standard deviation squared. That's why there's no square root over here. And this notation is mean and variance. Excuse me. I, I think I might have said mean and standard deviation. Mean and variance, whereas this is the standard deviation. Um, and so that's what we're plotting over here. Um, okay. And so, <laughs> yeah, lots of scary maths. Don't worry. The idea is we're going from mostly image and a little bit of noise to mostly noise with almost no image left um, as we increase this time because we're continually scaling down the, the x and adding a bit more noise, scaling down, adding a bit more noise. And if you do that enough times, the original image all but disappears and you're left with mostly noise. Okay, and so you can come in and swap out in our scheduler. You could add in these um, beta start, beta end parameters, right? And you can, let's actually do this. Um, so let's take this one here and let's see how we can change this plot if we just create it. And run it. So beta start is like, here we go. Um, we are, if we use a very, very small beta start and beta end, we're even after a thousand steps, still going to have quite a lot of the original image left. Whereas if we made this larger, um, and so now beta is constantly increasing, um, and thus our schedule is going to be constantly like adding more noise for every step, 
then we can see now very quickly the original image is all but obliterated and lost in the noise. And so you can see how you can kind of control this noise schedule, that's why it's called a scheduler, um, with these parameters. Um, okay, so feel free to play around with that. I'm going to go back to the original one that we defined up here, just to make sure that it's consistent with the rest of the notebook. Um, but you can also, oh, well, it can be quite fun to visualize. Um, let's actually do this. Let's get some time steps, right? So I'm gonna get eight different time steps, starting from zero all the way up to 999. And then I'm gonna use the scheduler's add noise function, which is gonna do this. It's gonna take those schedules that it's got internally, alpha bar and so on. Um, and it's gonna give us our noisy version of the input, and then we can visualize that, right? And so we can see at time step zero, we get our original image. And as you go and add more noise, that image is all but obliterated. Now it's a little bit tricky to show these images because the noise is scaled, so you get these like clipping, um, but you can go and explore. Like if we go back to this one here that had um, much less noise, even at the end of the schedule, you'll see that yeah, you can still see now the butterfly's rough shape even towards the end of that noise schedule, right? So you can, yeah, experiment around, maybe try the um, cosine schedule as opposed to the linear schedule, which is the default. Um, and you can see that that as well leaves more of the image intact for longer. I'm just going to go and plot that quickly. Um, there we go. So that, again, this, this blue line is how much of the image is there versus the noise. Um, and so you can play around and different schedulers are gonna have different um, pros and cons. We're gonna stick with the default for now. So I'll comment this out again and we can double check. Yeah, and so this is what our training data is gonna look like. We're gonna take some images, we're gonna add some noise and we'll add random amounts rather than this regular amount, but we'll add some noise to them. And now we want to learn how to undo that. All right, so it's about time we looked at the actual model. Um, okay, this is gonna be a long video, um, but I hope you're here and excited about that. Um, okay, so we need something that can take in an input and produce an output of the same shape that is the prediction. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to use something called a unit. You can go read the original paper by clicking that link. And this is going to have um, this kind of series of blocks. And the first few are going to be down blocks. They're going to take their input. They're going to produce an output and then usually down sample that. So at each level here, the size of our output, 64, 32, 16, 8, this is shrinking. And you can have only three down blocks or, or five, depending on how big your input images are and how small you want them to get. Um, we're just halving the resolution each time. Then we go through some middle block and then we're doing the opposite on the other side. And each of these can just be a convolutional layer. Um, usually it's something like a ResNet block where you have multiple convolutions and a skip connection and maybe like layer norm or something like that. Some complicated little neural network block um, and you can have a different number of channels out of each of these. So this one could take in 128 by 128 image. Maybe it's a three channel, you know, RGB image. It could spit out uh, 56 channels or something like that. 32, 64, 128. So you can control all the parameters of these down blocks and up blocks. And this is a very simplified diagram. Um, but the key thing that makes this a unit as opposed to just like an autoencoder is that you also have these horizontal like skip connections. So I'm gonna take the output of this down sample block. I'm gonna feed it through the next one and so on through the whole path. But then when I'm doing my up blocks, I'm also gonna combine in this output here. So that's gonna allow it to have this much shorter path through the network where it can access this kind of like higher resolution, um, less processed version of the input without having to go through all the intermediate layers. So it's a very nice architecture. It's very useful. Um, in this case, we're using yeah, these ResNet layers um, and you can go and inspect the model. So let's load, let's load the one up that's built into diffusers. And in the other notebook, we'll create our own um, more simple one, I think. Um, okay, so we're gonna create a unit model. We're gonna specify the down block types, right? And so this is these down blocks here. We can specify that some of them should have something called self-attention, right? Which we won't go into too much in this lesson, but maybe I'll talk about it in a future one. Um, and then if you wanna see what this model looks like, you can just model, and you'll see that we get this big, um, model summary out from PyTorch. Uh, okay, so here we go. So we've got a whole bunch of output, but we're gonna start with okay, some time embeddings, which we'll talk about later. Then a list of down blocks. These are those um, blocks in the diagram. First one, ResNet block. So it has group norm, convolution, group norm, dropout, convolution, some nonlinearity, switch nonlinearity. And we have a second ResNet block and then a down sampler, right? And so this whole group here is one down block. And then there's, I think, three of these. Um, no, four of these. Let's see in the definition. Yeah, four down blocks, four up blocks, a mid block, 
Um, so quite a complicated model. Um, we'll compare that to a much simpler model in the other notebook. Um, but the nice thing is smart people have already implemented that for us. And so we're going to pass in our noisy x and some time steps to the model, and it's going to make a prediction. And this prediction is the same shape as our input. And this is saying, um, in this case, what is the noise that was used to make this noisy image? And if I know that, then I can get the original image without the noise. Um, and we'll talk at the end about that. Um, okay, so there's something I've skimmed over, which is that we don't only pass in the noisy image, we also pass in the time steps. A lot of diffusion models will do this, right? You condition on the time step because that's kind of giving the model a hint as to whether it's looking at a very noisy image or a very clean image. Um, and so by feeding in this as extra information, we can kind of give it a hint as to what stage in the process it's at. Um, and if you look at the model summary again, you'll see that there is some extra infrastructure there for handling the time. And so when you pass in the time, it's going to go through a time step embedding. Um, and then there's going to be these time projection layers that are like adding in that information about the time step at the different stages in this, um, in this model. Anyway, small aside. Um, but it's worth knowing this is going to be pretty much all the fusion models that we work with are going to have not just the noisy X as the input, but also some additional conditioning information. Okay, enough preamble. We now have all the bits in place to actually do our training loop. So we're going to do exactly what we described. We're going to sample some random time steps. We're going to noise the data accordingly. So that's creating our randomly, r randomly noised images with random amounts of noise based on the time step. We're going to feed that through the model. We're going to compare the predictions with the target, and then we're going to update the model parameters. So I'm setting up my scheduler, setting up an optimizer on the model's parameters, and you can play around with the learning rate. And then I'm going to do some number of epochs, and let me just do one epoch for demo here, because then we'll load a pre-trained model. So for every batch in the data loader, we've got our clean images. We've got some noise. We are picking some random time steps between zero and the total number of training time steps, which is a thousand. We're using that to create our noisy images, thanks to the scheduler. And then we're getting the model prediction by feeding those noisy images and the time steps through the model. And then we can calculate our loss, which is just the mean squared error between that prediction and the original noise. Lost the backwards, optimize about step, optimize about zero grad. And every now and again, we can print out the some of the losses. And so you can see here, I'm not actually even going to run this. Loss starts out fairly high, gradually decreases over time. Um, and if we plot that, we see that the loss does you know, gradually decrease. And if it looks like it's flattening out here, plotting on a log scale, which is this graph on the right, is nice just to show that it is still going down. It's just that the initial drop is much bigger than the gradual improvement as we keep on training. Anyway, um, so let's not run that training. Let's just load the model from the butterfly pipeline before. That's what um, the way I generated that was by running this training loop. Um, okay, so now we have this model. How do we generate images? So option one is to put it in a pipeline, right? And we create a DDPM pipeline by specifying the unit and the scheduler because those two together define the behavior. The model was trained usually with that scheduler. And so it's been trained at those noise levels with those time steps. Um, and so we can put that together, wrap it up in this pipeline again, um, and we can call a pipeline and it's going to go through a thousand sampling steps and it's going to produce our image. Right, that's pretty great. We can save it to folder if you want to save those model components. Um, and that's going to save both the uh, model and the scheduler. So we have a folder for each. If we look in the um, unit directory there, we should see the like PyTorch model.bin. Um, yeah, diffusion PyTorch model.bin. So this is the, the actual unit. Um, but we also have the scheduler info just because it's going to save things like the type of scheduler, beta start, beta end, all the parameters in the scheduler config. Um, okay, so that's pretty cool. That's kind of like, okay, my nice standard usage, you want to use the pipeline. Option two is to say, now hang on, like what's actually going on? When I call that pipeline um, image pipe, you know, as a function, what's actually happening? So if we uncomment this here, double question mark brings up the, um, oops, it's changed since. I know there's a new version of Diffusions now, so I'm going to make a note quickly to <laughs> update the notebook. All right, and you see this, this should hopefully be there. Um, but you can see on my left hand now, we have this call function with all of the source code. Um, a little tricky to read there, but what I've done is basically just recreate that 
functionality uh, in code. So this is what the sampling look, look look. This is what the sampling loop looks like without all of the fluff. We're going to start from some random noise, right? That's going to be our beginning point, and then we're going to run through the time steps. Um, we're going to start from. Let's just look at what these look like. So these are a set of time steps starting at the highest noise level, 999, down to the lowest, all the way down, and we're just going one at a time. Um, so we're going to run through all of these time steps, starting at the most noisy, with just our completely random starting point. And then we're going to pass that noisy sample and the time step through our model. So this is going to give us our model prediction, and then we are going to update the sample given that prediction. Right, so the noise scheduler is also in charge of this step function, which is going to take the noisy x and the model's prediction and use that to produce a slightly less noisy version of x. And if we run this, it's going to take a while um, because we're doing a thousand steps, but it should eventually produce some images. And if you're curious, we can look at the noise scheduler.step function to see the actual maths that is going into that update step because we've got the model prediction. How do we do the step? Um, but to summarize while we wait, what it's going to do is it's going to say, okay, here I am at my noisy sample. Here's where the model predicts. But especially at high noise, I don't trust the model prediction. So I'm going to move just a little bit in that direction. And I maybe will add just a little bit of extra noise if I would like to keep the process um, slightly around. So we're going to move move a little bit. Then we're going to get the next prediction. Then we're going to move a little bit, get the next prediction, move a little bit, get the next prediction. And hopefully the closer we get, the more accurate our predictions are. And eventually we will keep approaching that over a thousand steps, we'll get to our final results. And you can see um, we now have this set of vaguely butterfly looking things. And if we look at what the original sample looks like, um, it's going to be just pure noise. So we have started from pure noise and then we've done this iterative refinement, the slow gradual denoising that is the hallmark of diffusion models. Um, and that's what's happening when you call pipeline.forward or pipeline.call. Um, it's behind the scenes, it's running through those time steps. Um, okay, looking at the step function, we have some inputs. Um, there's different prediction types now, so they have to handle that. We are calculating those alpha prod, alpha prod t, beta prod, beta prod t. Um, then we're getting our predicted original sample, which is some combination of the model output and the current sample, um, because the model, model is predicting the noise. Um, and we've got to scale that by the time and so on. Um, once we've got a predicted original sample, you can do some clipping if you'd like. And then you're going to calculate some coefficients. There's a formula in the paper. Um, and our, let's see, predicted previous sample is going to be the uh, some coefficient times the predicted original sample plus some coefficient times the current sample. Right. So we're saying, okay, that's what the model predicts. This is where I am now. We're going to do some scaling factor of where the model predicts and some scaling factor of where I am now. That's going to move me a little bit in that direction. Um, and then optionally, we're going to add some noise. And the DDPM sampler does add a little bit of noise. Um, some samplers don't. Okay, so that's the sampling process. We'll talk more about sampling later in other units and in the other notebook. Um, but that's what's happening behind the scenes in the pipeline. And so the nice thing is we can just wrap our model in the pipeline. We can upload that to the hub. And so this whole section here is going to be just uploading those files to the hub, pushing a model card. Um, and then you can load that in a different notebook later. It'll download the weights from the hub you don't have to worry about it. Um, okay, so that's diffusers in a nutshell. We half an hour in. Um, the last bit of this notebook is running the official training script instead of this notebook to do some training. And the difference is, if we look at the script, it's gonna have, oh, let's open a new tab. It's gonna have pretty much the same things that we saw Oh, goodness, this is not a very good way to look at it. Apologies for no code highlighting or anything. Um, okay, so we've got a whole bunch of arguments that we can pass in for things like how many epochs, uh, when do we want to save images, do we want to log, etc., etc. Uh, lots and lots and lots of arguments. And then once we create our thing, we're going to create a model, slightly larger model than the demo we were using. You could come in and edit this. In fact, I recommend that. Play around with different settings, how many channels per block, um, how many blocks total, which ones are attention blocks versus normal, and see how that works, see what batch size you can get away with. But then we're setting up a scheduler, setting up an optimizer, optional data augmentation, 
loading a data set. We have a, a learning rate scheduler for the optimizer, but fancy there. Um, we have something called exponential moving averaging, exponential model averaging. Um, again, kind of optional, but cool. And then let's find the training loop for epoch in number of epochs, for step batch in the training data, get our clean images, get some noise, make our noisy images, make the model prediction, calculate the loss, loss that backwards, optimize that step. So the same stuff's there, but it's wrapped with Accelerate so that it can be run on multiple GPUs. It's got lots of extra features for like saving demo images, saving to the hub, etc., etc., etc. Um, so it's quite nice to look at that. You can use the script like so, right? So you can just pass in, this is the data set I want to train on, the resolution, so what I want to save it to, number of epochs, etc. Um, and then you can go and push that to the hub as well. Um, you can see we trained a slightly higher resolution, slightly better model. So you can use that script instead of running this notebook. That might be really nice. Um, but just know that even though there's all that extra stuff there, that very intimidating big wall of code, it's still very much the same thing. It's that same formula that we looked at in the introduction. We take some data, we add some noise, we try and predict that noise with the model, like we try and fix it. And then during sampling, we're going to start from random noise. We're going to iteratively denoise that until we get to some images. Um, and that's diffusion models. Um, okay, so hopefully that's given you a little taste of what this library can do. Uh, so now you can try create your own model, right? Use a different data set. You maybe use the training script, see how cool you can get. Um, there's a big, um, set of, of data sets that you can look up here. Um, you can also try Dreambooth, although I would wait until unit three, since that's out now. We're having a Dreambooth hackathon at the moment, so you can train your Dreambooth models, compete with other people, see who's got the best model in, I think there's like five different categories. There's some prizes, swag, so I highly recommend doing that. Um, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna look at a different take on this introduction to diffusion, which is the second notebook, this diffusion models from scratch. So let's go there. Um, I'm just going to shut down this runtime. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, well, while we wait, we can start on this one. Um, you probably want to file, save a copy and drive if you want to have a version that you can modify yourself because at the moment this is just loading it from GitHub but because I'm just doing the demo for the notebook, it's fine. Um, okay, so there we go, run anyway. Um, I am still just going to make sure that I... Hmm. This could be my internet just being very dodgy, so I might have to cut this part out of the video. We'll see. All right. Okay, so we're in the second notebook. Um, there was a pause there while I just waited for things to connect and switch over. And so here we're gonna do something slightly different. We're gonna write diffusion models as if we haven't read any papers about diffusion models. And if you can just vaguely remember my hand wavy explanations from the video up until this point, um, we're going to say, well, what if we wanted to implement it just based on that? Um, and then we'll compare our example to the original diffusers one that we looked at before. What's the same? What's different? What are the improvements and so on? So some minimal imports, um, setting up the device again. Uh, you don't have to run this on a GPU, but it's going to be nice if you don't want to wait for training. Um, okay, so this time we're going to start with much simpler data. 
we just have these grayscale handwritten digits, classic machine learning data set, MNIST. Um, you can try Fashion MNIST if you'd like a, a fun variant that's images of clothing rather than digits. But this is nice because it's very recognizable when something's working, it's very easy. Okay, so how do we corrupt our data? How do we add noise? One way that we could do this is to say, okay, I'll make noise in the same shape as our input. And then I'm gonna use this amount and I'm gonna say one minus amount times X plus the amount times noise, right? So it's like a, a linear interpolation, a lerp between the input X and the noise. Um, and so if amount is zero, we're gonna get back X the same as before. If amount is one, we're gonna get back pure noise. And in between, we'll have um, some mix of the two. So that's exactly what this function is doing. Make noise in the same shape as X, choose the amount. And in this case, this is just reshaping it to be the right number of dimensions so that I can do noise times amount. Um, and then this is our function, X times one minus amount plus noise times amount. And if we apply this to our data, right? So I'm just saying, okay, for amount between zero and one, um, do this corruption, right? We get exactly that. Starting from no change, all the way up to like completely corrupted, no visible image. Um, so you'll notice the schedule looks slightly different to the um, nice like alpha bar, you know, scaled whatever approach from the DDPM paper. This is just kind of like a linear um, function of the amount, um, but it works. We're adding some noise and we're going from nice image all the way to like fully corrupted image. Okay, so that's our scheduler. It's just like picking random amounts of noise. Uh, now for the model, we're going to create a unit. Um, we are going to... Oh, look, I made a nice diagram. This is probably more like the um, the diffusers unit that we were using before, maybe. It's been a little while since I looked at this code. Um, okay, well, actually, yeah, this is what, it, this is what we're doing. So we, we're creating our basic unit here. We're just using convolutional layers as our, um, our blocks. And so we're going to take on our input, put it through a convolutional layer, so our, our single channel image is now a 32 channel image, and then we're gonna downsample that. So it was 28 by 28, it's gonna be 14 by 14, 32 channels. We'll put it through the next conf, 64 channels, downsample, so now it's um, seven by seven by 64. I put it through final conf, put it through the upward path, it's just the same but with upsamples. So um, our basic unit, we initialize our convolutional layers, we have an activation function, we have this downscale, max pool, and this upscale, just n end upscale. Um, so this is just going to half the resolution or double the resolution, um, respectively. And so when we feed some data through, we're going to go through the down layers, and for each one we're going to pass in our x, x is equal to soft activation of that layer of x, um, and we're also going to store the outputs in this little list h, and those are for our skip connections. And then in the up path, we're going to go run through, for each one, we're gonna pass it through the layer and the activation function. But before that, we're also going to add in that data from the skip connections for all except the first up layer. And this is for all except the final down layer. So it's these little skip connections here. Boom, boom. Um, and these are being stored in that little list H until they're needed. So this is like as close as I could get to like, what is the most minimal unit I can code? Um, there's no normalization layers here. There's no decent initialization. So you could definitely improve on this a bunch. You could use res blocks, etc. Um, but we'll see if we can get this going with this basic unit, and then we'll compare it to the diffusers unit and see how much better that does. Okay, so we can create our network. We can take in some input, right? Noisy data, batch of eight, 28 by 28 pixel, single channel images. We can feed it through the network and we get out and output in the same shape, right? So that shows it's working kind of as we hope. Um, and we can check the number of parameters. This has 300,000 parameters, 309,057. So you can try changing the number of channels in each layer. You can try adding extra layers um, or trying different architectures. Remember that you're halving the resolution each time. So starting from 28, 14, seven, if you try and half that, you'll get to three and then you double it, you get to six, there's a size mismatch. So if you wanna do like a four layer unit, um, just make sure that you pad your inputs to like 32 by 32, and then you can half that resolution a bunch more times. Um, okay, so we've got our network, great. Um, we can now do the same training. So we're gonna create a data loader, number of epochs, network, loss function, optimizer, all the same. We're optimizing the parameters of our little basic unit. Um, and then for each batch of data, we are going to pick a random amount between zero and one as our noise amount. And we're going to use our little corrupt function to make our noisy version of X. 
And then this time we're not even passing in T, right? So there's no time step conditioning for this basic unit. We're just feeding it the noisy version through the network and looking at the prediction. Um, and then as our loss function, we just want this network to denoise the image, right? So we can predict the noise, but we can just as easily predict the denoised image itself. And so that's another difference between this and the diffusers. Um, because if we didn't know any better, that's how we frame diffusion models, right? It learns to uncorrupt a noisy image. So fed a noisy image to me, makes sense, predict the clean image. Um, and that's exactly what we're going to have it do. We can pop the loss, check that it's learning something. Um, and maybe I shouldn't have run that because it might take a little while. We'll see. Um, okay, well, we can see in the meantime, um, here's some input data. We're going to corrupt it to different amounts, and then we're going to feed it through the network just once. So just calling net of this noisy input. And you can see when the input is fairly clean, the model predicts the clean version just fine. And when it has little bits of noise, the model does a really good job, actually, of denoising that image, of predicting the denoised version. Once we start to get to these higher noise levels, um, the model doesn't really have enough to work with. And so you can see here, this vaguely looks like a five, but it's kind of hedging its bets, right? It's all blurry. And for this one, where we know there's like no rem remnants of the signal left, we just get this kind of blurry mess. Um, and so it's worth thinking like, what is the model doing? So the model is trying to predict the denoised image. And when it has absolutely no information to go on, and it's trying to like get the best mean squared error it can, this sort of blurry average of the data kind of makes sense, right? It's like, make your best guess based on this noise but really there's very little for it to go on. Um, and that's why we don't just do this in one shot. That's why we don't just have a, you know, a single shot diffusion model, right? Instead, we're gonna do this iterative refinement. Um, so we've trained our model. It seems like it's learned something. You could definitely train it for longer. Um, so let's start making predictions. And what we're gonna do is we are going to, instead of jumping in one go, we're gonna break it into five steps. So starting from some random data, I'm just gonna keep track of the history for the plotting. We're going to get our model prediction, and then I'm going to calculate this sort of mix factor. And this is me saying, okay, here's, here's where I am now, noisy x. Here's where I want to be, my model prediction. I'm going to do a fifth of the way there for the first step, right? So I've done one out of five steps. Um, and so I'm going to have some amount times my current x and some amount times my predicted x zero. Right, and then I'll repeat that again and again, each time I'm moving like some fraction towards the, the final goal. And so for the final one, um, we're gonna have our like final predictions, but you can see for this input here, the model predictions are all just blurry. But if we move a little bit in that direction, we get this input. And if I feed that into the model, I get some slightly sharper predictions. Okay, cool, I use those to update, right? Some amount times this plus some amount times those predictions gives me this feed that into the model, I get even sharper predictions, right? And after five steps, you can squint and see maybe an eight to three, an eight to zero, a seven, something like that, right? A four, it's not perfect, um, but it is something. And if we do this over 40 steps as opposed to five steps, same code, just um, making a whole batch, one, two, three, one, four, four, seven, seven, nine, three, six, seven, those kind of look like digits. Um, no, they don't look like very good digits, right? We hardly trained, we have a very basic network with no initialization. Everything here is suboptimal, but it works. So that's very satisfying to me because that just shows like this is the essence of diffusion. Train a model in this kind of iterative refinement and sample it by making a number of predictions and moving a small amount each time till you get to your like denoised output, right? Um, but there's better ways to do things. And so now we're gonna kind of compare and contrast how is this different to the diffusers version, the DDPM version that we looked at. So one, the unit model is way more advanced, right? They have residual blocks, they have proper like layer norms and group norms and all that good stuff. They have dropout, they have um, just a much nicer implementation overall. They have a tension. Um, the corruption process is handled differently, right? That schedule looks slightly different. Um, the training objective involves predicting the noise rather than the denoised image. And even though those are somewhat equivalent, we'll see that there's some slight differences. And they give the model a hint by feeding in the time step as well, so that it knows how noisy of an image it's looking at. Um, okay, so lots of different sampling versions available, lots of improvements. Um, so what I thought was quite interesting is, well, let's just take their good unit, because maybe that's the weak point in our process here. Let's take the good unit um, and let's load that in. Right? And you can see 
a lot more complicated than our six convolutional layers. <laughs> um, so that's great. It also has like nearly two million parameters as opposed to a few hundred thousand. Um, yeah, nice, sensible model architecture. Now, um, the diffusers unit expects to get a time step t, but we're just going to always feed t equals zero so that it's just basically working on the noisy input, right? And this is, is fine. We're creating a network. This is all the same as before. Um, when we do um, prediction is equal to net, we have our noisy x, and then we just pass in time step equals zero. Uh, a couple of reasons I'm doing this. One, I mean, we could go from this noise amount to like an equivalent time step. Um, but I also just wanted to show like this time step conditioning is not necessarily necessary. Um, you can get away without it, right? Um, oh, I might have erased my output, so we'll have to wait. Hopefully this doesn't take too long. Um, <laughs> well, you can trust me, the outputs look nicer. Um, and so straight away, just by changing, we're still using our very hacky, like corrupt function. No plan schedule or anything like that, just this like linear let, linear interpolation. We're still only feeding in the noisy input, no time step conditioning or anything like that. Um, and we're still sampling with our same kind of hand wavy, you know, move a fraction of the way each time, I'm sure it'll be fine approach. And we're still predicting the denoised image, right? So our loss function is still, unlike the diffusers example, we're still comparing our prediction to the denoised X, the clean X. Um, let's see how this is going. Okay, still no outputs, um, that's a pity. Yeah, so we can compare and contrast. This is now going back over like the stuff we looked at before. The DDPM noising schedule looks slightly different. They have a different approach, they have different scalings. Um, and so you can kind of plot that here versus ours, which was just like a linear mix of the two. Um, so this is probably better. Um, we can apply that noising to some images. Uh, and then the other thing is, yeah, this training objective. So they create some noise, they create the noisy X model prediction, and then they compare the model prediction with the unscaled noise, like before it's been added to X or anything like that. Um, so that's a slightly different way of doing things. What it comes down to is that these different objectives, because there's also now ones where you predict a velocity, which is like some combination of the noise and the initial input, depending on the time step. Um, it just means that the weight, the, the loss values are gonna be higher or lower at high noise steps versus low noise time steps depending on exactly how you measure that loss. Um, and so setting that up in different ways is going to result in a model that like focuses on high noise levels or focuses on low noise levels to different amounts. And this can affect like the quality of the samples at the end of the day and the ultimate performance. And so for the moment, at least predicting the noise, the so-called epsilon objective um, is kind of a default, but I'm seeing a lot of more recent models use this so-called V objective, which you can read about in progressive distillation for fast sampling of diffusion models, um, or they predict the original denoised image, or they have some other complicated objective that they make. Um, so the TLDR is that this has an effect on performance, um, but the research is kind of ongoing, and I wouldn't worry too much about it if I was you. Okay, this is still going. You'll just have to take my word for it. The diffusers unit is much better than mine, um, and so that's there. Um, okay, they also take in time step conditioning. It's sometimes useful, but I don't believe that it's perfectly useful. And we're experimenting with models that don't need that at the moment. Um, sampling is a whole world of literature in terms of like how big of a step do you take each time? Do you do the same size step each time? Um, what noise schedule do, do you follow? Does it have to be the same as the training one? Um, and so in the next uh, unit, we'll look at a sampler called DDIM, not in much depth, but just to get at this idea of like these, these different samplers. Some of them offer equivalent quality samples with much fewer steps than the original DDPM version. And this is again, an area of lots and lots of active research. Um, and so that's something that's improving. And it's all around like, how do we use the current prediction to inform that step? How big of a step do we take? What schedule do we follow? All those are design choices that you can play with. Um, and so there's a few um, links to go check out like what samplers are available, what schedulers are available in the library and so on. Um, and that's it. That's the end of the second notebook and thus this walkthrough of unit two. Um, I hope that wasn't too long, but I know some people had been asking for video versions just to have like a more relaxed exploration of the notebooks rather than simply like, you know, just having the text, which is fine. I quite like doing this. It's been a little while since I revisited these. So hopefully I haven't made too many egregious errors in my explanations. Um, yeah, so if there's still questions that you have, chuck them on the diffusers. There's a diffusers model class channel on Discord. Um, or you can reach out to me. I'm John Whitaker on Twitter and everywhere. 
um yeah and i hope you're enjoying this for me is just like trying to get across just the very much the basics like what is diffusion what are we doing and if you've got this idea that we're taking images we're adding noise and we're learning to like remove this noise again and by doing that over a number of steps during sampling hopefully we get to the stage where we can generate images from pure noise and that's what generative modeling is that's our goal generate pretty pictures from pure noise um which means we can just generate as many pretty pictures as we want so in the next one which i'll record just now um, we are going to say, what if we don't want to do this training from scratch because it takes ages and the quality is not really good. We've got these tiny little butterflies. What if we would like to do better? Um, we're going to look at fine tuning existing models. And we'll also look at some ways that we can augment the sampling uh, to give us additional control. So I'll see you in the next video, which should be uploaded fairly soon. Cheers for now.